Welcome to High Tech Heroes, the program that takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now, coming to you from the studios of Cablevision of Urbana Champaign, nestled amongst the cornfields surrounding the University of Illinois, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the people here at Cablevision of Urbana Champaign for letting us use their studios. Without their help, we wouldn't be able to make this program. Our guest this week was born in Highland, Illinois, where, at three years old, he began using electricity to melt Christmas tree tinsel. By the time he was 13, he knew he was going to be an electrical engineer. In high school, our guest built a motor scooter, became a ham, built electronic projects, including a device to aid in playing pinball. After high school, he worked for a year as a machinist, served in the Navy, where he learned radar, and then earned a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois. As an undergraduate, our guest was the first person to observe the spin echo, a discovery fundamental to nuclear magnetic resonance. As a researcher at the university's control systems lab, our guest developed moving target indicating radar, designed the gyroscope-based inertial navigation system for aircraft and nuclear submarines, and used sounding rockets to measure the Faraday rotation of the ionosphere. He then became a professor of aeronautical engineering, and until his recent retirement, taught various engineering classes, where his students built many projects, including aids for the handicapped. Decades ago, our guest proposed orbiting a gyroscope to test Einstein's general theory, an experiment similar to one currently being implemented at Stanford. Our guest's hobbies have included photography, flying, cabinet making, and even being a mechanic for a stock car. He's currently operating a sawmill, which he designed and built from scratch. I'd now like to welcome to our program an all-around engineer who, once while trying to focus on an elephant in a parade, stepped backward off of a bridge and then took a picture of the bottom of the bridge to prove it. Professor Howard Noble. Hello, Howard. Well, how do you do, Sherwin? Welcome to High Tech Heroes. It's good to be here. Yeah, well, it's great to be back in uh, Champaign-Urbana here in the cornfields. And University of Illinois, John Bardeen territory and so on. So, now, when you were uh, playing with pinball machines as a uh, teenager, uh, they paid off in real money, didn't they? They did at that time. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, how, what was your method for, uh, for getting it to pay off every time? Well, I tried a scheme to use a magnet to influence the motion of the ball, but uh, that didn't work too well because it had been... In anticipate it uh -huh. and the balls were not magnetic. Oh. But one day I noticed uh, uh, the hole where the electric cord comes out of the back of the wooden cabinet mm -hmm. was that large and if I put my finger in I could pull out a cable which mm -hmm. was a bundle of colored wires. The machine was like a horse race machine if number seven was lit up and you shot the ball and it went in hole seven then you would win hard cash. Well, the <laughs> That's great. Well, go ahead. The numbers on the backboard of the machine were colored, and on this cable were corresponding colors. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I discovered that if uh, number three lit up and the ball rolled into number five, and number three was green, I find the green wire, and number five was uh, maybe blue, I blue, find the blue yeah. wire, I could cut my pocket knife across those two wires, join them together. Then both three and five would light up, and the pay counter would see, run. So they both would be winners and of course uh, and the ball was already, already in, in one, one of the winners. <laughs> that's right. Well that was, that's, uh, that's a good uh, use of technology I guess when you're young. Um, now how was it that you came to be the first person to observe the spin echo effect? Well I was a technician working on the research project and I'd built all of the equipment. We were measuring block decay which is an, em an emission which comes from the spin echo after having been pulsed with an intense radio frequency pulse. Right, so it's sort of an exponential decay after you line That's up right. the axes. That's right, and, yeah. and just by chance I was making this test fairly frequently and I noticed if I pulsed it once and then pulsed it again at an equal time later there was a signal appearing on the oscilloscope. So you were basically just playing with the equipment and you, you pulsed noticed it a couple that. of times That's and correct. noticed another pulse downstream mm -hmm. and, and uh, you didn't think that came from the equipment? No, well, there couldn't be anything in the equipment that would have that long a time constant. So, so the, uh, uh, the other researcher was really perplexed. He thought it would be the equipment. And it took mm -hmm. him several weeks to come up with an explanation. But uh, it finally led to a publication. 
Right, and so that's, I think that's what they use in uh, MRI imaging or, you know, magnetic resonance imaging all the time now. Yes. Uh, so. um, now, after that, I guess uh, we, we're going to skip through the uh, radar stuff to the gyro. Now, you brought some of the old gyro models here, it looks like. So how did this, uh, how did this stuff the, work? The, the electric uh, vacuum gyro was uh, conceived by Professor Arnold Nurczyk uh, back in the very early 50s as a solution to the Navy's proposed nuclear submarine. Mm -hmm. Now, we already had inertial navigation systems that would run accurately for quite a few hours. Right. But the idea of the nuclear submarine was to stay submerged for weeks or months and then come up unexpectedly and have sufficiently accurate navigation information that the missile could be fired. Or a torpedo, I suppose, whatever. Well, uh, they were already thinking missiles at that uh -huh. time. Uh -huh. And uh, there was a need for a more accurate gyroscope than uh, the conventional ones that were gimbaled in ball bearings. So this must have been classified information. This was until, classified secret. Uh, until recently, for, I suppose. Yes, until just maybe 10 years ago. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Remained classified for 25 years. This is years. a model here of... Uh, well, this was the first uh, one that actually worked and demonstrated the principle. There was a vacuum gauge here, but sometime in the interval it became broken off. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And uh, so how do, what's inside? How does this thing work? There's a ball inside, which mm -hmm. is the uh, gyroscope inertial element. Now, a normal gyroscope is a wheel that spins mounted on gimbaled bearings. Right, right. Uh, this ball spins in evacuated space. The mm -hmm. vacuum eliminates any molecular friction, and it is supported by an electric field. Many years ago, at the time, I could run the comb through my hair, Mm -hmm. and pick up a piece of paper to demonstrate the, <laughs> the forces of the electrostatic attraction. Well, in the apparatus, the electrostatic attraction is provided by an electrode which has a high voltage and is very close to the ball. Now, did you uh, think about using magnetic uh, uh, levitation? I guess, uh, I guess the way you did your ma pinball. Ma magnetic uh, levitation uh, is not free from torsion disturbances mm -hmm. because you really can't get what you might describe as a perfect magnetic conductor. I see. But you can get a very near perfect electric conductor well, so that the field lines are forced to enter perpendicular to the surface. Mm -hmm. And if the surface is an accurate sphere, then all the forces act through the center and there can be no moment to disturb the gyroscopic action. Right. Now, I guess you don't get eddy currents that, uh, that mess Not up? Not due to the electric field. Okay. The magnetic fields would be uh, very detrimental, so it has to be shielded from magnetic fields. And what's this ball made of? Uh, beryllium. Mm -hmm. uh, beryllium is more rigid than steel, and it's lighter than aluminum. Okay. And the ball in these gyroscopes weighs 15 really. grams. Mm -hmm. There are six electrodes so that it can be supported in all of the six directions. Uh -huh. Normally the one on top will have the highest voltage now these, to support the weight. Right. Now these little cups are what support it, is that right? Yes, they, so are, they are within a few thousandths of an inch of the ball. Uh, this one was assembled as a demonstration. You can mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. how the electrodes and the ceramic insulators are arranged. Yeah, okay, I see this. It looks like uh, the, uh, okay, these are copper here and those are aluminum, but it looks like there are six of these in a cube, essentially. Uh, where the faces of a cube would be, and then there are eight uh, of these ceramic washers where the corners of the cube would be. Yes, those are to space the uh, electrodes mm -hmm. properly, mm -hmm. and the electrodes then would form a complete enclosure so you have that. around the ball. So then we could put another one here, I guess. Well, oh, I see. I'm lacking Oops. a washer. <laughs> okay, I see how it builds up anyway. So that's, and and that's completely enclosed. more washers go on top, and mm -hmm. finally there would be a top electrode here. And when it's assembled, there'll be just a few thousandths of an inch clearance right. between the ball and, uh, and now, the electrodes. Now, but the ball is completely symmetrical, and electrically, you say it's, uh, it's chosen because it has a good field. How can you tell where it is? How can we tell how where the ball tell, is? Well, how can, yeah, well, you have there, to there, know there its, its orientation, things. right? Uh, one of the questions is how far is the ball from the electrode to keep it centered? Right. See, that's the, le the problem of levitation. Right. And that's the first problem to be solved, and uh, before this... Uh, was developed, there had been work for nearly five years attempting to levitate with the electric fields and no one was successful. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. when we worked on it, we uh, finally got it to work. Uh, a typical way would be to sense the clearance between the ball and the electrode by the use of a radio frequency uh, 
capacitance right, measurement. Right. Actually, we had a more sophisticated technique in the one that we used, but it's too complicated to discuss here. So now you have a ball that's levitated in the vacuum, not touching anything. We would initially use magnetic fields generated by coils, which are spaced around uh, this equipment, mm -hmm. to cause the ball to spin okay. and to align it up with the typical celestial reference. Then the magnetic fields would be removed, and it would just coast for the neighborhood of a month. Really? Now, during that time, we have to be able to measure the direction of it. Okay. If you look carefully here, you might see just a little bit of a zigzag pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I guess if they really zoomed in on this, on this hole here, let's see it. Uh, I don't think the lighting is good enough. Well, here's a pictorial representation oh. here. Okay, on the, on the real gyroscope, four microscopes look through these four sapphire windows mm -hmm. at the surface of the ball. And on the surface is something like this? On, on this drawing, we see a zigzag pattern, which is uh, colored on the spherical surface. And if the microscope is looking at the center of the pattern, mm -hmm. we get only second harmonics of the pattern periodicity, and there is no fundamental component. If the microscope is scanning through other than the center of the pattern, then the waveform looking like this contains a fundamental component, and that fundamental component enables the data processor to know which way to move the gimbal which carries the housing, so that right. the housing is always accurately aligned with the inertial axis or spin axis of the I ball see. itself. And then you read out the, actually the orientation of the housing. From, from accurate uh, mm -hmm. uh, equipment there, yes. Well, that's great. Well, we have to take a break now, but um, Howard's going to show us his current project, uh, a sawmill that he built uh, right after this message. Kareem, we'll never see eye to eye on anything. Don't be so short-sighted. We can both see that space research benefits everyone. I oh, like the scratch-proof lens developed for the Apollo space camera. That same technology led to scratch-proof eyeglasses, sunglasses. And even goggles. You wouldn't need those if your horse was always in front. <laughs> That's a tall order. What we're learning up there... Is helping us all down here. Space technology. This is what's in it for you. Wake up with all the teachers. Time to teach a new way. Maybe then they'll listen to what you have to say. The power of teaching. The world won't get no better. The power to wake up young minds, the power to wake up the world. Teachers have that power. Reach for the power. Teach. I'm Edward James Olmos, and we're recruiting new teachers. Call 1-800-45-TEACH.